if we're good. And so I hope you can put everybody else on mute so that nobody sitting at home can end up talking to us, but we'll try to work there. Okay, I'll go again. Um, welcome everyone to the, the annual Belfast meeting of the Irish section of the PWI. Um, we do it once a year. Um, we try to get something interesting. We invite people from Bouncing, south of the border and elsewhere, and hopefully we'll get a few people from further afield when we go mm -hmm. online. Um, I'm not going to say very much. I'm standing in for the chairman today who wasn't available. Um, so we'll send his apologies. we we'll welcome everybody else. I'm not going to do much other than saying in the room, there's no fire alarms. Hopefully everybody has their phones turned off. And um, without much ado, I think we'll get straight to it. I'm going to ask Mervyn McCollum, the head of Permanent Way for TransLink, to give a wee introduction to our spe two speakers. Thanks, Mervyn. Being in court, so. uh, look, it's my pleasure. Andrew's asked me to have a few words. It's my pleasure to be doing so. Um, Real health strategy, obviously, today presented by Tony Knight and Niall Mellon. No point me going into much more detail on that because the guys will give you a good presentation of their own. What I do want to do is hopefully put in a wee bit of context. Um, obviously, every contractor, every business, every department has their own challenges to face and their own problems. And the sort of person I am, once you find a problem, I'm keen to start finding solutions very shortly afterwards. And I think for me, this has been a really good example of a department, our department, hopefully identifying problems a few years ago, then they're going to have solutions. And we're lucky enough today, a lot of the people who helped us implement those solutions are in the room, which is appreciated. And hopefully the guys will touch on that in their presentation. But for me, it's a really good example. And as well as the technical part of the talk, there's also that cultural part and behavioral part about Fine, as I say, the, identifying your problems, finding your solutions. But then you also need people for you who will embrace those solutions and who drive the solutions forward and get it delivered. And I certainly rely very heavily on those people. And I see this, as I said already, as a good example of us identifying some solutions, but then, especially for me, people taking those challenges of implementing the solutions and running with them. And I think it's been a really good example of a job well done, and it's one, hopefully, as well as the real health strategy, we can all take out of as well the need to keep identifying solutions and delivering on the ground, because that's where it really matters most. And with not more to do, pass over to the presenters now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. Okay, yeah, look, I, I'm done as well, and I say thanks very much for attending. It's fantastic to see the number uh, in the room here, and as well, look, uh, with people online. So. Yeah, we really appreciate their attendance. Hopefully, uh, it's interesting for you to see real health strategy, how we developed it, how we implemented it. So, yeah, like Merton says, I do a bit of an introduction. For those that don't know, my, know my, I'm, look, I'm looking around the room, I think probably know most of the people in here. But anyway, I'll do a, a wee bit of history on me and, and Niall. I'm Tony Knight. I'm the track maintenance manager. I know I don't look it, but I'm in the railways about 18 years now, sort of varying roles. Started off as a assistant, assistant district engineer 18 years ago. I moved on then to the position in Port of Iron as track section engineer, where I was responsible for the maintenance and inspection of the assets. Uh, about three years ago or so now, lucky enough to get the position that uh, I'm in at the minute as, as track maintenance manager, and I've uh, been working on it ever since. Niall, a colleague of mine, Niall's the senior project engineer, joined TransLink about three years ago, three and a bit years ago, I had been working sort of 10 years prior to that in different rail schemes across in Great, Bit Great Britain, such as the Orchard Cord and the Northwest Electrification. So again, a good uh, good background in railway. I'll take you through the order of the presentation. Uh, I'll do a bit, now I'll do a bit, then now I'll pass back over to me. So we'll start off with the background introduction then I are. Look, the people in the room I know will know uh, the, the network quite well, but again, maybe a few of us who aren't, or a few of us that are interested in, in how things have went down over the years. I'll then take us through the decline in assets and move on to how we develop the strategy uh, for the Permanent Way Department. Niall, in my opinion, will probably deliver the most important part, which was actually implementing the strategy out on the ground, the most difficult part of it. I then go on to uh, talk about some of the benefits then that we realised through the department. Give you a brief sort of look at some of our future plans that we're we're thinking about, and then uh, if there's any questions at the end, myself and I'll be happy to take them. 
Okay, so this is the Rona Railways Network. What we'll have here, we've sort of four radial lines heading out of central Belfast. We have the line heads down through Port of the Iron, Bondon Uri, and then cross border to Dublin. Short line out to Bangor, short line out to Lauren Harbour, and then the line up to, to Derry. Small branch line from Coleraine to Port Rush, and then one that's not on the, the screen here is the Antrim branch line. It's this huge line, so that uh, is not shown, I suppose, as an operational railway. We have approximately 950 IRJs, IBJs, whatever you want to call them, across the network, in around 170 point ends, tend to be in around the, the main junctions, which in around Belfast and some of those spurs that you'll see off there as well. We have 60 level crossings and approximately 80 user of crossings, just hard to keep track of them because every so often they close one, and uh, yeah, that, that's good to see at times too. The network in the north has been completely renewed since the 1970s, and then in the early 2000s, we had a huge push towards taking away all of our jointed track and, and bringing in CWR, and that was largely uh, in the north north half, I suppose, of, of the network there. We have approximately 45% of our line is single line track, and again, that's heading up north to Derry, and then the rest of it. 55% of the network is double line track. So look, we're no different than uh, any other network. We have declining assets. This first graph I'll show you, uh, it's, it's quite clear that what we have here is the average age of our assets in years. We split the assets into real, sleeper, ballast, and then looked at s &C separately because it's a very distinct sort of asset that uh, poses uh, peculiar problems. Uh, for us. So, look, as you can see, everything's kind of heading in the wrong direction since uh, 2002 up to the latest there in this graph shows us 2019. Those common peaks and troughs, we do get levels of investment at times, which is line closures where we'll relay sections, but unfortunately, those sort of mile sections or five mile sections or whatever they might be, they don't have a big enough impact uh, on the overall age of the asset. So unfortunately, you do start to see uh, the age of the asset creep up. As far as investment goes, it's probably no different than anywhere else. We do yeah, public monies, public investment into, into public transport uh, does tend to be quite low. And in particular, for the railways, it is a bit of a problem. Historically, and I suppose even till today as well, investment in Northern Ireland, as far as the railway goes, is probably less than other regions of the UK and, and maybe less than, than Southern Ireland as well. The next uh, set of graphs we're looking at, a uh, graph on the left hand side shows the remaining design life for all of our assets. Graph on the right shows the rail as part of that, and uh, you can see they're very, very similar. Two thirds, 66% roughly, then is in the final five years of its design life. Okay, so in 2019, uh, we sat down as a department and looked at some of the areas that might cause us issues down the line. 2019 is a I suppose a bit of a landmark year for us because it did uh, it did sort of bring forward a restructure within infrastructure as a whole and within permanent way. And uh, we got a new leader at, at the head of PWA and pointed us in a, in a very clear direction where we needed to go. So as part of that, like I said, we sat down and, and looked at where are the risks as we see them. First risk is the quantum of axonal defects. I'll get to that in a minute, and uh, we'll see where, where our difficulties were there. The next risk is the emergence of rolling contact fatigue, or RCF. Those two risks are going to form the basis of this presentation. Third highest risk for us was uh, stress-free temperature records. Look, it's not going to really be part of this presentation, but I think it needs a, a wee bit of explanation around it as well. Our stress-free temperatures in the North here probably weren't fantastic. We did stress our track, but uh, centralising those records was something that uh, probably needed improved upon. 
and uh, obviously identified as a risk for us. So good news is we had a project kicked off in around that time using burst testing technology. We went through the entire network and re um, identified all of the stress, identified then the areas that needed restress or needed attention. And as a follow-up from that project, uh, we had teams of uh, guys going out and restressing through the network then in the areas that needed it. So I'll go back then and deal with the, the first risk, as we say, the highest risk. And this is the quantum of action will real defects. 2017 on this graph, you can see number of defects quite low. We split them into actionable and non actionable We work from network real standards. So actionable for us is a defect that is going to have to be addressed that has a time scale on it. Anything else is, is a monetary defect. It's something that we're quite content. We can, we can deal with that. Uh, it can stay in the track and we'll retest it and see where it is. But you can see in, in 2017, yeah, look, it was quite manageable at that point. 2018, then we see uh, a slight increase. But in 2019, it really did skyrocket for us uh, and it became extremely difficult to manage. We, we did it, but it was hard going. It was tough, 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 uh, tough year to deal with ultrasonic defects. The one thing I'll say here is we didn't change anything. Our method of testing didn't change. Our testers actually didn't change. It was the same guys doing it. The trains didn't change. There was nothing there. But something happened at that point between 2018 and 2019 to skyrocket those, uh, those defects into, yeah, into the quite difficult to manage uh, area. Uh, those of you know, that's, uh, that's Mr. Andrew Williamson's hand shot. As Shog is holding, uh, yeah, it's it's one of the, the defects that we would classify as category 1A. It's uh, one of the higher level defects. Longitudinal splitting of the web, difficult to identify through visual testing, but picked up ultrasonically and then removed on the night. So, yeah, that's, uh, we don't find them everywhere. And in fact, it's the first one I had seen in my career, but look, good to get it out of the track. The next slide will show something that people are, I uh, suppose, a whole lot more familiar with, real head squat. So hopefully you can see it there on the picture. Uh, these come in varying sort of levels, you know, depending on the length and depth. They can be one of the highest uh, category defects that you have to get out there and then, or they can be a monitor defect, just depending on where they sit. I'll move on now uh, to the second highest risk then, as we saw, which was the emergence of RCF. RCF wasn't really a problem for us. We didn't see it in large areas of the network for quite a period of time. Study, study done in the early 2000s uh, came back for TransLink to say, look, RCF in a particular gauge corner cracking wasn't really going to be a problem because we don't run heavy freight. But Something happened in the round 2018, 2019 that, uh, that increased the level of RCF across our network. And we've seen the growth of RCF <laughs> in certain areas exponentially, uh, and it became quite difficult to, to manage and to deal with. The only options available at that time was just re real have to get it out of the track. Uh, but look, as everybody knows, that's a costly exercise. So uh, what we did as a department then, we sat down, tried to come up with then the strategy, look, how do we deal with this? How, how is RCF something that, that we try to make manageable? We decided then on three phases. Uh, what you have here in phase one is real in its early life. It's not too bad. It's, it's, it's pretty good condition. Low number of defects. Any cracking that's there isn't picked up visually, so it's, it's very, very... A uh, light cracking, very micro cracks on the head, the real, not something that you're going to uh, ever worry about. Moving on to phase two, into sort of the half life then of the real, approximately 25 years, quite a few tons over it as well. You're starting to see now visual defects, starting to see the squats appear, and you're starting to see more non actionable defects per mile. You're starting to see an increase in actionable defects per mile as well. So this is getting into the, the time when we're going to have to do some sort of intervention, whether that be 
you know, the range of welding interventions, head wash, MMA, uh, remove the uh, dermot or or put in a small section of rail. Beyond that, then we're into a uh, phase three. So this is rail that is beyond its half life now. It's it's into the area where it needs a uh, maybe more severe intervention. Maybe it's it's longer lengths that have to be re real. So you can see here on the picture, yeah, that's that's clearly the pattern of RCF along the head of the rail. In phase three, we're going to see more of that. We're going to see an increase then in non axonal defects and definitely a very, very big increase then in axonal defects uh, in the reels there as well. So look, as part of this, uh, as we move through from the early life to beyond the half life, we look at some of the, the other interventions that are available to us, not just going in um, maybe removing the, the well, they're putting in a closed reel. We started to think about other areas like reel milling uh, and other areas or other methods of testing, like eddy current testing as well, that will help us identify these uh, problems before they become bigger problems. It's very nearly not going to put this slide in. Uh, I'll have to be convinced. And look, we've, we've done this presentation yesterday in, in Tullamore and I was talking to a couple of guys afterwards and they said, look, though, it needed to be in because it reminds people, I suppose, why we're doing this. This is the outcome of a poorly managed and poorly maintained track. This is why we do what we do as maintainers. This is why we develop these strategies to make sure that any of the, the interventions we have have a demonstrable impact on safety because this can be the outcome, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of those pictures for me as a maintainer. It does give me a wee uh, shiver down the spine. You know, it's not easy to look at, and it's not something we want to be. But it is a consequence of failing to manage your assets correctly. Okay, so over the last few slides, then uh, I've looked at declining assets. I've spoke briefly on some of the, the different levels of intervention that's available. We'll move on now to developing the strategy and developing the strategy for us and tying all, all those different things together rather than looking at them individually and dealing with RCF individually and dealing with real defects individually. We had to come up with something then that optimizes uh, the work that we do and left us then with a real at the end that uh, we were content again to go back to it that showed that we had uh, improved the safety of the real. But not only that, as engineers, it's up to us then to ensure that we're extending the life of the asset too. So that was the focus of uh, developing the strategy, tying those strands of testing and defect rectification in together. That led us then to look at the real as a system. Uh, so in, in 2020, we, we uh, set out this strategy then across the maintenance teams. So as I said, look, we, we sought to optimize uh, we sought to optimize the rail as a system, but that meant carrying out the right intervention at the right time. So we'll go back to what I said before. It is key about doing that, making sure that before you maybe rail mill, you remove your defects. Before you remove your defects, you maybe do something else. You you upgrade an IRJ and so on. So all of the all of the aspects of the rail uh, strategy had to be tied together into track maintenance, upgrading the components, the testing and the defect removal. And then on to the likes of real mill before. Unfortunately, as it goes, if this age for every asset, it, it uh, has to be renewed. But that has to nearly be uh, the last roll of the dice for us. So, what we'll have here then is our uh, asset wheel. You can see, look, it, it's the maintenance, refurbishment, renewal, and enhancements. Everything ties in together. The maintenance side of then is your testing and inspection. You're tamping and packing and uh, changing the consumables. The refurbishment side, then that looks at the real defect removal, maybe the stressing as well, and very, very definitely real mode. If you can't refurbish, like I said, you have to renew it. We'll get to that point. So it is re real, but it goes back to it. We're engineers, we have to try and stretch the, the asset life as much as we can, and we try to push that out as far as we can. <clears throat> but if we have to renew, we start thinking about enhancements. Are there other technologies available? Are there other materials available to us that we can put in place that when it comes back around to maintenance again, <laughs> uh, it's maybe a wee bit easier to maintain or, or it uh, 
it doesn't fail just as soon. So by those type of things I'm talking about, the likes of coded rails through tunnels and level crossings, high performance rails on curves that are giving us high wear, and new IRJs uh, that have uh, factory glue joints and hot bolts, etc. So at this point, I, I'm going to hand over to Niall, and like I said, Niall will talk us through the implementing strategy. Thanks, Tommy. <coughs> um, so, the first sign of defence for real health um, is track maintenance. Getting maintenance right, you increase the resi res residual life of the rails. Uh, it reduces the stress through the rail wheel interface, allowing wheels to follow the optimal contact band, um, reducing hunting. We need to have annual inspection plans for all of our key assets. Annual maintenance plans are also required for preventative maintenance, for s &C, level crossings, and clay line joints, as well as changing key components. Um, undertaking regular tamping will optimise the track geometry um, and applying different levels of maintenance at the right times, um, for example, specialised S3 welding. So, the permanent weight department maintains approximately 950 pairs of IRJs across our network. The majority of these IRJs are six hole uh, banker joints. Uh, which were installed using on-site fabrication during overnight possessions. Um, so for the replacement of these strategic legacy ARJs, where maintenance is no longer uh, uh, sustainable, the department has decided to upgrade a six-hole shock loop manufactured joint, which is a more robust and reliable asset. Here's an example located outside of Antrim, at one of our level crossings. Um, you'll see the image on the left is a, a banker joint with his life expired. Um, the level crossing was up for renewal, as it was beyond maintenance, uh, with a temporary speed restriction of 50 mile an hour through the site. The IRJ was difficult to maintain for line and level. Um, and the local maintenance team were returning twice weekly to pack and replace local sleepers. So rather than reduce the speed further, it was agreed to upgrade the joint to a six hole shock load joint. The replacement was carried out in one shift which included the removal and replacement of the IRJ, as well as stressing and welding. We worked with our s and colleagues um, who upgraded the track ends and ducting. Uh, <clears throat> the upgrade and renewal took place without any impact on operational services, and the work reduced the maintenance to a normal level, not requiring any further speed restrictions. So, <clears throat> the removal of SMWs is another key component upgrade which we're addressing. By replacing the wells as recommended by the standards. The SMW welding process left an inherent risk for defects within the well, which is difficult to identify through ultrasonic testing. Uh, so, the photograph in the centre and bottom of the screen is a well that we, which, broke, we, which we removed a few years ago outside of uh, Murray. We've actually got this well with us here. I don't know if you can see it there, but um, the defect was a cold spot between the well and the foot. Um, it's extremely difficult to identify a drill on a test. And there's also other sort of defects um, with poor porosity. With I'll just pass it around to those who would like to see it. So, uh, we, we've had 1,600 SMWs across our network, um, but currently they're programmed mm -hmm. and to be replaced um, by using stress enhancers in place. There's no requirement for weak stress in the rails either side. On the left-hand side of the slide in red, you can see the SMW, um, which is prone to the effects due to the lack of fusion, inclusions, and poor porosity. Uh, and on the right, you can see in green uh, the well, which was replaced with an LA white black well. So between 2017 and 2019, Northern Ireland Railways recorded an exponential increase in the number of ultrasonic testing defects, as previously discussed by the whole. Analysis showed that the axial defects were being removed. The propagation of non axial defects to axial defects was becoming unsustainable. Progress of testing was especially through, slow through a 20 mile section of the pre 1976 rail with its inherent manufacturing defects. Full compliance with the standards for the removal um, was not being achieved in every occasion. Defects were not being removed in line with the prescribed timeframes as a result of resourcing and funding constraints. <coughs> For the current list, we developed a new testing methodology. 
uh, through a real health strategy to maximise efficiencies and minimise the impact on the operational real world. The approach was to organise testing, verification and the removal of high priority defects that occur within the same shift. When, te when the testing team identify a defect, the vehicle stops in transit, the test will carry out a verification scan, classify in accordance with the standards. The permanent waste supervisor assesses the defect, working alongside the welding technician to determine the most suitable course of action. Um, so we've developed a hierarchy of repair to assist with the decision making process. Number one, can the defect be removed using available welding processes? Number two, can a closure wheel be installed that removes the defect in the remaining possession time? And finally, number three, is an emergency temporary speed restriction required to allow operational traffic after handback? So a faulting and repair team follow behind the testing unit, fully equipped with closure reels, vice plates, clamps, and emergency temporary speed restrictions. Under the instruction of the permanent waste supervisor, the carry out actions in line with ultrasonic testing hierarchy. So, following immediately behind the faulting and repair team is a standalone welding team with the skill set capable of manual metal arc welding, otherwise known as MMA welding, and a range of other thermal welding processes. This slide shows the MMA welding process with the defect being removed. <coughs> And the rail is pink from the residue of the die panels from testing, and the picture on the right shows the, the rail head being fully restored. So, despite there have been over 350 accidental defects across the 2020 and 2021 testing campaigns, with this method of testing verification, no emergency temporary speed restrictions were, have been introduced due to ultrasonically identified defects, and full compliance with the management of rail defect standards has been met. Following rules of route possessions for testing, verification, and the removal of uh, the line was handed back to the operator safe and a full line speed every morning. With a limited budget, it is vitally important that the processes of the permanent way department um, use are cost effective. To do this, we have a multi skilled workforce. Each member of the team is trained to carry out a number of roles, including safety, technical, without compromising either. With real health in mind and a proactive approach to maintenance, rather than reacting to defects as they appear, funding allowed the department to, to use the same approach to remove non actionable defects before they became problematic. This was nicely targeted in sections of track identified for rail milling, avoiding any unnecessary repairs to rail that have, um, that have been milled. From 2020, the permanent weight department introduced a new innovative method of non destructive testing, Edicon testing, that captures the, the top five millimetre of the rail head, an area on team by ultrasonic testing traditionally. This gives a complete picture of the condition of the rail and enables the department to proactively treat emerging RCF. Using pedestrian units and operatives to serve the network, we've been able to build up a, a database of microtracking on the head of the rail. A section of track outside of Portadown, previously identified for complete re railing has been analysed using this technique. Six miles of rail renewal, as identified in our capital plan, has been reduced to one and a half miles, uh, providing value for money and saving millions of pounds. So, edit current te testing allowed the department to focus on sections of rail that have moved into the highest phase of crack propagation, mm -hmm. along with a high number of defects found through ultrasonic testing. The data has been instrumental in driving our upcoming rail milling campaigns and underwriting engineering decisions made to re-rail sections of track that have progressed into the latter phases of RCA. So in the absence of bespoke adequate testing analysis software, I developed a method of graphically analysing the data using Microsoft Power BI. This combined with the analysis of cumulative tonnage over the track, real age, and RCF in various phases helped to identify areas that would benefit most from milling and areas that have gone beyond realistic milling depths needing to be re -reeled. So another solution uh, Northern Ireland Railways initiated was rail milling. Uh, we done a trial in 2017 which proved to be operationally successful. Milling is recognised as a midlife intervention that removes surface defects and reinstates the idealised rail head profile. 
The strategic view of the department was the introduction of this new technology and our infrastructure is a huge benefit and will extend the life of the rail mm -hmm. and improve safety by removing stress razors, future defects, while they're still manageable, rather than wait until crack propagation gets to the stage with the only option is the replacement of vessel. So through lobbying our business partners, funding bodies, a four-year programme of rail milling was established. We've now milled with two passes, approximately 80 miles, equating to 25 percent of our network. The department wanted to be in a position that when the milling campaign was finished, real health was in an optimal condition. So this slide shows some of the results of real milling with dependence and testing. The first image on the left shows the uh, the real head with surface defect evident. The middle image illustrates the first milling pass with one millimetre of real head removed. And as you can see, there's still some defects visible on the testing. Uh, the last image on the right shows the second milling pass with two millimetres of real head removed. And as you can see, there's no surface defects visible on the testing and an idealised real head profile is fully restored. So here you can see the benefits of milling. The image on the left shows the rail prior to milling and the associated eddy current data with high volumes of surface microcracking. And the image on the right shows the rail post milling with eddy current results showing an 80% reduction in the number of defects. So ultimately, the time comes when maintenance interventions are no longer sustainable. And other factors like corrosion, side wear, head wear of the rail will also impact the decision to re rail. One solution is to use higher grade products, for example, high performance rail with associated enhanced lubrication. These are used in areas where rails are being changed frequently due to increased side wear. Another solution in our arsenal is um, where corrosion is a factor. We've taken the decision to program enhancements using Zenoco rail. Zenoco rail is a standard rail where the web on the foot is coated in sacrificial zinc layer. And we're installing these in local rails in all of our level crossings, tunnels, over bridges, where corrosion is a measurable defect. Another enhancement is explosive depth hardened crossing noses that have been installed in our most operationally critical junction to reduce plastic deformation and increase longevity. These hardened noses will be installed across other areas of the network as enhancements take place. So, just to summarise, it's key to the strategy that are a range of targeted interventions do not adversely impact on other interventions. By planning the delivery of the strategy, <laughs> you need to ensure that there is alignment across all interventions and applying the right solutions to the right problems at the right time, or potentially multiple solutions to the right place. We'll just pass you back over to Tony and talk you through the benefits. <clears throat> Okay, I'll uh... I'll take the last wee bit of the presentation and uh, just move back on that Thank you. Uh, right, the first bit I'll look at, I suppose, is one of the most important areas for real health, which real breaks. Uh, look, we, we've started going back a number of years. We made the cut here in 2017. You can see, look, there is kind of nearly a level. We were getting in around two real breaks per year. Uh, when we implemented this strategy in 2020, We'd seen then a, a quick drop off. Then we had zero real breaks in, in 2021. And touch wood, to date in 2022, we haven't had any. Uh, the real breaks, quite a high proportion of them, have been around the SMWLs. And again, that's why, as part of the strategy, we've decided that we're going to remove those SMWLs from the network at a rate of an around uh, 400 per year. That bit of real that was passed around there. That's a bit of real that you're looking at in the in the presentation. I know because I'm the boy that went down, put those jogger plates on, and put the clamps on. I got the call at two o'clock in the morning, so uh, I know uh, too well about them personally. Right this next slide then shows us a <clears throat> previous graph that we looked at that's now been updated for our data up to 2021. So again, this is looking at ultrasonic defects, axial, non-axial across the network. The last graph that we looked at before, cut off of 2019, where you've seen the high peak there. After we introduced our real health strategy, you could see a sharp decline in uh, defects across the network, down to a much more manageable level 
Still higher than what he'd like, but we're still working on it. Good news is we're currently ultrasonically testing our network at the minute. We're approximately a quarter of the way through, and we're seeing the same trends. We're seeing defects are still falling. Uh, and look, as it stands today, I've done some of the analysis earlier on the information that we're getting through at the minute. And uh, our method of testing, verification, and removal is working because in the areas that tested up 25% of the network, we have now no actionable defects in the areas that tested. So it does work. It is difficult. It does. Uh, yeah, look, it does give us a headache when it comes to resourcing and managing, but it's a process that does work for us. <clears throat> As part of the real health strategy, look, we, we had to come up with better ways of reporting as well. And um, reporting for us, I know there'll be there'll be a few of us here when we hear the the letters KPI, they'll, they'll give a wee bit of a groan because it's it's one of those things that we'll have to do every month and gives people a bit of a headache. They can be beneficial. And this is where we see a lot of benefit as well uh, as part of the strategy. We decided, look, for rightly or wrongly, uh, we would look at real defects across a track mile or a real mile across the network uh, and see just where we stood. So in 2019, yeah, again, it was somewhere that was the high level of defects, somewhere where we didn't particularly want to be. And our combined ratio uh, of defects for track mile was 2.32. When we introduced the strategy, last year's uh, data then allowed us to look at it and it, it showed, look, we're moving in the right direction. We got the number of defects combined down to uh, 0.74, and the actionables, and that's uh, one actionable or uh, one mile is, is equating to 0.34 actionable defects. One of the other benefits we look at is cost effectiveness. Again, I suppose, look, as, as, as an engineer, yet yeah, you have to look at safety first. It has to be about getting value from it and stretching the limited budgets that we have. In 2019, the cost for our ultrasonic testing across the network was north of a million. Um, it was taking 79 shifts to carry out that work. That was difficult to manage. That was difficult to resource. Uh, again, since we brought the strategy in, we've got that down last year. It took 32 shifts, less than half, and that less than half the cost as well. Now I'll hit on it in, in his part of the presentation then about how we plan it. We plan on a weekly basis and we plan for Lean teams, lean teams for us doesn't mean understaffed, and lean teams for us means multi-skilling, making sure that the people out on site they they can do technical jobs, they can do safety jobs, but like Nal says, one doesn't uh, have to compromise the other. So again, look, we 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 prioritise removing the defect over the TSR as well. We will have a graph here to show, but delay minutes are down. I uh, haven't spoken with some of the colleagues in our S and D department. Again, we're noticing. Defects around IRJs, track circuit faults, that has come down as well. I think this summer, and again, it was a particularly hot summer, uh, with a number of weeks there where, where temperatures were north of, of 25. In around that time, you expect lipping at IRJs, you would expect potential track circuit faults. We didn't have one this year because the strategy pushed us in the direction where we identified our failing IRJs and got those upgraded. Again, we have a updated graph showing the average age of our track assets. <clears throat> Unfortunately, sleepers, ballast, test and see still heading in, in, in the wrong direction. We still need further investment there, and, uh, and we'll start to see those, those numbers come down. But what we are seeing, <laughs> since we introduced the strategy, since we introduced real milling, we're stretching the life of the asset. We're making sure that uh, the average age of rails is heading in the direction that we want it to be without having those costly renewals. I'll talk very briefly about our future plans. Brian, we are looking at it. It's up for debate whether or not it's it's for us, but definitely look, it's it's an area that we'll have to give a wee bit of consideration to. One of the big things for us, I suppose, over the next year is going to be the introduction of dual eddy current and ultrasonic testing. At the minute, we ultrasonic we test, we test for uh, we do eddy current testing, but not at the same time. So you're doubling up on shifts there. Again, it's about cost effectiveness is, is a big part of it. So we are investigating then for your current uh, current structure and current contractors, is there a way of carrying out 
those two types of tests at the same time. We carried out an uh, investigation with British Steel into RCF across the network and how it was developing and why we were seeing a, an exponential increase in some of our curves. That information is coming back. It's, it's quite good. I think British Steel was seeing some benefits from it as well. They had brought in Huddersfield University to do some modeling. And uh, some of the information that was coming back, it, it may not just be applicable to NIR, so there may be benefits that could be shared with the wider industry. On made inspection and, and PLP or plane line pattern recognition, there's probably not a, a maintainer in Europe anyway that isn't thinking that way. Are there better ways of inspecting? Are there ways that we can get boots off the ballast? Is there now automated SNC inspection and plane line pattern recognition? It's been used in the UK now for a number of years, and they're seeing quite good results. So, this is the last slide. You'll be glad to hear. Uh, yeah, look, the, the strategy was put together in 2020. We decided, look, because we were seeing quite good results, so we we took our chances. We entered it into the Asset Management and Maintenance Excellence category at the Real Business Awards last year. Um, yeah, we we've, we've done well. We we came back as winners. You see up in the top right hand corner, there's a couple of happy guys over in London. Uh, got a nice night out. So look, what I do have to say is this isn't an individual award. This isn't an individual strategy. This is me and Niall are the lucky ones because we get up here and get the pre presented to you and tell you all about it. And uh, hopefully you can see some of the successes we've had. But it isn't definitely isn't a one man show. So. There is a few thanks. Look, while I am here, I have to say, without a doubt, the senior leadership team in TransLink provided the funding, uh, made sure we had the tools to be able to us to happen. Tom was as head of PWA. He came in in 2019. He's been the driving force behind this strategy and the guy pushing us in that direction all the time. We have uh, others within TransLink. We have a uh, project manager and, and, and the team in projects as well, as well that keep us right on the governance side. Of it. We also have our supply chain in Babcock and RPS and OTT and others that make sure that we we're able to do our job as well. The guys in the bottom of the picture, are the guys want to thank them. We have divided the four sections in Portadown, Adelaide, Balamina, and Coleraine. And without the buy-in of the section engineers, without the buy-in of the track works coordinator, and uh, first and foremost, the buy-in of the guys that's actually doing the work, the guys that's actually out there replacing the IRJs, they're the guys that have made the strategy successful. So a huge thanks to them as well. So look, that draws this presentation to an end. Uh, thanks very much for listening. And again, look, thanks very much for your attendance. Um, it has been nice, and thanks very much to the PWI for an inviting myself and Niall to, to carry out the presentation today. Quite happy if, if anybody wants to take any questions. I think we can get the two guys up back to the podium again. I'll maybe do the field. I haven't really worked this in the room and online stuff before, so please forgive me if I don't do too well. I suppose we'll go for the room first. Usually get a bit of silence. They get a bit of silence. Yes, I'll come. And then when this first started off, we just we saw them the look and track and all. Uh, and actually, you did then mill that as new rail. And I wondered, is there any data yet available to see the benefits of that by building the, the new rail, which is supposed to give you far longevity on it? I wonder if you've got anything to along those lines. There's, there's nothing hard and fast to come back up to with because right. the, the, the any current data that we've done after showed us good real, showed us yeah. where it's going to be. It's still young real, so it's, it's in that phase one where I would expect really no actionable defects, very, very low number of non actionable. So at the minute, that's what we're getting. It is where we expect it to be. I'm not going to come back and say, well, no, look, this hasn't worked. Right. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe because we don't have the data to come back and say, look, there is actual defects here. It's where we want it to be. Nobody else is asking. I'm going to ask you, Antonio. Over. 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 Over
Um, I haven't been involved a little bit myself. I don't know if it came out well enough, but can you describe the team of people that is required on a night shift to follow <laughs> the ultrasonic tester? Yeah. And, and just give people an idea of the scale of the operation. Yeah, it might sound uh, it might sound quite easy because you say right, we, we test and we verify, and remove the defects. It's not just as, as clear cut as that. We have first of all the vehicle, the testing vehicle, and we have to follow the rules of Northern Ireland Railway. So there's different competencies involved. They're not just the technical guys actually on board. So we have our VCs there as well. We have uh, people making sure that it runs um, through the network the way we want it to run. So there's a team of guys actually on the testing unit. We have a team following behind that. What, that's what we call the plating and clamping team. Now, that's our own sort of maintenance guys. They're following behind with an RV, stacked with a number of closure rails, clamps, plates, saws, every bit of kit that you could think of is following behind. And if they find an uh, axonal defect, whether it be a Category 2 or a Category 1, they're the guys that put the clamps on. They're the guys that put the plates on. They're the fellas then that cut the closure rail in they leave it safe the next morning. And they're the fellas that really make sure that there's no speed restrictions on the next day. If they're not doing that, they have to have boards. And if we can't take that Category 1A defect out of the track, that's a speed restriction on. So we have a pretty good success rate that through the last number of years testing, like Niall said, I think, we, we haven't had to put a speed restriction on due to ultrasonic testing. They're the guys, again, like I said, at the end, they're the guys actually doing the work. Behind that, again, we have two teams of welders. So another two RRVs with independent welding teams. Back to the, the lean teams again, we make sure that those welders are multi-skilled. They're not guys that can only do thermit welding. They also do MMA welding. They can also do head wash uh, repairs as well. So the multi-skilled guys. If I was to put numbers on us here north, we're also doing it, it's, if it is north of 35, 40 people out on a night shift making sure that this works, making sure that the defects are removed, and making sure there's no speed restrictions. So yes, look, it's it's labor intensive, it's resource heavy, but it works. It works and it's it, it's given us good results. You don't get many miles a night. Done sometimes if you're sometimes facing, it'll be slow. facing trouble. Sometimes it'll be slow. Depending again, look, we do have cutoff points because we don't want overruns. So that's another big thing. We don't want overruns and trains to the next morning. <laughs> Maintenance is one of those things I like to think it's you're seen and not heard nearly. You know, you, you shouldn't really have any sort of impact on what happens on the daytime running. So, yeah, look, it's, it's, it, is, it is difficult. It's resource heavy, like I said, but let's not do that. Thanks for a bit of planning. Uh, if I could just add on the Andrew's question earlier about um, rail milling through Lurgan. Um, one of the advantages we've seen as well was you can get quite a lot of very superficial ballast damage to the surface of the rail just from the renewal process itself, you know, transiting back and forth the RRVs, you know, just the methodology of distributing the ballast. A lot of that gets crushed into the head of the rail. So it's a good opportunity when you have the miller available just to remove just a tiny amount of that damage off the head of the rail. So you've refreshed it and you've, you know, reset the clock on it, if you like. So one of the advantages. Mm -hmm. That's true. Is there any tie-in from your ops people in terms of <coughs> real wear and profile for the, the improvements that's coming back? Because sometimes your profiles can make a big difference, can't they? Not really, Andy, no, I'll be honest. With you. Not really. Probably not yet. No, maybe, well, maybe that's maybe that's the right answer. Not yet then. Yeah, okay. I've got a hand up online, Jack Mitchell. I will test the technology. Are you, Jack? Yeah, that, is, that is me. Yes, thanks very much. Oh, brilliant. We got you. <laughs> just, a, just a question, Niall and, and Tony. As you know, we're, we're uh, proposing to put uh, side cut composite sleepers on Belfast Transport Hub um, and replacing the wooden sleepers. Is there any other uh, innovations that you guys know of going forward that you might plan to, to bring into the, to the network? Yeah, look, we're, we're always open to the new innovations, we're thinking about undersleeper pads. If we did, we put undersleeper pads in at Lagging Junction. That might be yep. one of the things that going for as well that, that we look to introduce as a standard maybe for any time we're reviewing. So yeah, yep. look, we're, we're always up for, for innovation. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jack. Here's Jack. Anybody else in the room? Oh. oh. Uh, I'd already 
specific areas in the network where the percentage of actual defects is higher? Yes. Good question. Uh, we had a section of track south of Coleraine, which is pre-76. So pre-76 rail was cast slightly differently and there was inherent defects in that rail. We were finding a large number of actual defects there. Uh, and in fact, last year, that was the only area. So it placed about 15% of the network. It was the only area that we got the highest category defect. Everywhere else, the rest of the network, 85%, had no category 1As. Good news is, that's now in the process of being reviewed. They have re-railed between Coleraine and Balamoney, and hopefully at some point they'll keep heading south to renew it. But yes, those areas did give us particular problems. Yeah, Miles Dunch on there, certain areas worse than others. I don't see any more hands up online. If you're going to speak or you want to speak, put your hand up. Anybody else in the room? Speak now or forever hold your peace. That means we're actually quite good on time, guys. There we go. There we go. Um, so I'm going to close. And uh, I, I volunteered myself to give a thanks to anybody else who wants to do it. So listen, if you're sitting there and, you, and you've got to try and think of it, it's not a pleasant thing to do. Um, from my point of view, Tony Jair Brave while I move here even longer. And uh, I think what the guys put together, I'm probably biased by the way, what they put together was quite a, a swift run through how NIR dealt with the change in environment. When we had joined the track, all we ever had, all we ever seemed to have was bad top due to dip joints and then broken rail ends. And in my head, um, people like us says, we ever get it all CWR, that's us finished. What will we do the rest of the time? But lo and behold, as railway engineers, once you fix one thing, someone else comes to get you. Luckily, it keeps us all employed. Um, but RCF was never a problem. We started fitting, fitting six old joints in around 2000. Again, that was another one of those times we said, nothing left for us to do. But like every asset over time deteriorates, they were really good. Deteriorates, they show their age. If you keep on working with them, they start to break your sleepers, no matter how much you pack them, they 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 still go down. So the aspect of identifying the key issues and taking them on, I think you should be proud of, gentlemen. <laughs> Some of the data that now put together and the information that come out of it to show where you target. I don't think I don't think we could have done that before you come along now. We just wouldn't have the, the capacity to do it. So um I, th I think from an NIR point of view, you give us a very good presentation how we had you had to change and evolve to deal with the situation. We're changing and evolving about you. Um, the process we employed, many people outside of our organization might think, how did you manage it? You know, we're a small company, 1,600 mil gauge. We have to adapt to our own situation. And the ultrasonic testing vehicle we got in that stop and verify is very, very difficult to do. Um, and you've got to make the call to say, I'll keep on testing until I can't fix it anymore, and we'll come back and test tomorrow night. We were in a situation years ago, we made the call to keep on testing and we'll fix when we can. Um, that's quite a difficult call. Um, and especially when you start to think about the level of resource you're going to need to be able to take on defects. Then you've got to think about the level of equipment they may carry to give you a broad enough range that you can take on most of your defects. And the guys manage it. Um, and I, I, I still don't think you give it enough justice really to imagine how many vans turn up at, a, at, a, at an access point to all try and get on site and follow these two guys out in front with either the, the um, Land Rover or testing. It used to be ultrasonic testing was with us, a Land Rover or a couple of guys and off the head into the night and you get a report in the morning and then you knew where you were and army followed them afterwards. We had two guys in front with about 40 boys following them. And when you started the shift, you had no idea what you're going to get. Um, but you had to be prepared for it. So I think that's a real credit to be able to take that on. Um, things like the upgrade of the joints, the RCF, which I think you mentioned back in 2000. Some look over did a look at us and I said, don't you have to worry about RCF? You're using grade A reels, you're not using NDHT, your loads don't do it. And we went, oh, that's, at least that's good. And then almost 20 years later, it starts to appear again, just 
won't let long after getting rid of the joint, but find something else. And he will identify the problem and take it on. Um, I'm going to put Murph on the spotlight here. The home in on Miss Ivan's predecessor, Eugene O'Brien, home in on Millen as a potential as a potential fix. Our friends on RX Rail got there before us, but it's reset. Like I like to reset in the clock on your rail head. Take those defects out, you get more life. Um, those sort of innovations we're not even talking about seven, eight years ago. So it's a real good move forward. Um, I'm hoping I I probably know the history of it, so that's okay. But I hope everyone got a, a flavour of the journey that the NIR and these two gentlemen have been on over the last number of years. And I hopefully I'd like you to show your appreciation for the for their talk today. And then, because and then, I don't like to shut up, I just have to do the next bit. I'm going to ask Bob Clark to second. I'm going to thank first, please. Right. Excuse the attire. I've uh, been walking the track. And who better to walk it with than Tony here? Well, I'm Stevie Dan. Go on. As you probably know, we're looking at um, short, medium, long term opportunities to push the speeds up on the borderline. So uh, just walked. With Tony and Stevie from the border as far as Portadown, getting on to 30 miles. So we're out there looking at the track and the engineering, and uh, it's the only way to do it, in my opinion. But you get to know people when you're out walking for a number of days. And I got to know Tony pretty well. And um, the significant thing, I think, is not just telling me how far things could be pushed and perhaps where not and so on is the commitment that you, you can see from a guy like Tony uh, and, and his team. Uh, so you've got a great guy here. Come on, let me move Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, um, when I came across here, probably not more than five or six years ago, uh, I was asked to look at the way tracks and structures were being maintained, looked after. Um, and I well remember being quite nervous about the uh, stress-free temperature rail and how it was understood and how it was being managed and the actionable defects, uh, rail defects. And in the last five or six years, and you've seen the results, it's transformational, you know, and it's all credit to Tony and his team uh, to, to see the, those, those achieve those results. And the icing on the cake is the award. And quite frankly, you know, you and your team should feel very proud of what you've achieved, really proud. And um, the award is richly deserved. So well done. Keep it up. Thanks very much, Bob. Well, everyone, that's drawn us to a close. I'm just going to say to Joe, anything, any, any P-Way business? Um, Christmas Christmas meetings on the second of December, Friday the second in Dublin. Venue to be confirmed. <clears throat> Speech to be confirmed by Andrew. <laughs> okay, the AGM. The AGM is the big one. Dublin second. Second. Second Friday. And a good venue. Yes, We're working on them. And a good venue. <laughs> it needs to be as good to match Belfast. I know that. And the food needs to be as good as what the fish puts on. Nice tumble man. <laughs> that's fine okay thank you very much for uh, an entertaining afternoon thanks for your uh, company I think we'll draw things to an end thank you all again if I've still got Sarah online you can stop recording <laughs>